Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. Today, um, a really classical theorem, which is one of my favorite theorems. Also, of course, my favorite theorems is a very biased list. But I think this theorem is on the list of many people. So the so-called abel Ruffini theorem, named after, well, uh, Abel and Ruffini, for a reason I'm going to explain in a second. And yeah, as you will see, this is a theorem basically about loops and roots. Uh, not quite. The theorem itself has absolutely nothing to do with loops. It's just a statement about polynomials. Um, but I would like to highlight a little bit the proof. And um, of course, this is a YouTube video, so I can't give you all the details of the proof. There is a nice uh, paper linked in the description, which has a really short proof, uh, rigorous proof, uh, which is also very easy to read. And it, the whole proof is based on an idea of Arnold. Um, I hope I pronounced this name correctly. So the link to Arnold is in the description. So the Wikipedia page is pretty huge. So um, this Russian mathematician was one of the, well, one of the most influential mathematicians of around 70, 60, 50 years ago. So a uh, link to, for example, uh, one of the uh, pioneers of um, dynamical systems and so on. And also there, uh, they gave proof of the, um, Abel-Ruffini theorem, which is self-contained and doesn't use any Galois theory. So you might have heard about the uh, Abel-Ruffini theorem that you can prove it as an application of Galois theory. Um, that's all pretty good, but you don't need it actually. And of course, the original proofs by Abel and Ruffini were before Galois, so um, no Galois theory involved. Arnold's proof is based, so the one I'm going to present, is based on uh, Abel's proof. Ruffini's proof itself was, let's say, a little bit of a mess. I shouldn't say, probably shouldn't say that, but it was some, one of those 500 page proofs um, where people found gaps afterwards and nobody really understands. Anyway, so it, it's not a really, really um, enlightening proof in some sense. I shouldn't diss the poor proof, but, but you get the point. I, I don't want to read the 500 page proof. Um, Abel's proof is much shorter and th basically that's the one I'm going to present today. And let me just mention Galois theory again. So um, one of the main applications of Galois theory is the proof of the abel ruffini theorem. But Galois theory is much richer, right? Um, you could prove various long-standing, well, people were able to prove various long-standing conjectures uh, using Galois theory. Nowadays, they are not long-standing conjectures anymore because they were proved, of course. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a huge toolbox, which is very, very uh, successful throughout mathematics and probably beyond. I haven't checked recent applications of Galois theory. Um, but I mean, just to prove a certain theorem, you can have a different proof. Uh, for the experts, so if you know a little bit about Galois theory, I say it again, you don't need to, but if you know a little bit of Galois theory, we will recognize it because, of course, Galois theory is pulling the strings from the background. Um, anyway, I'm already starting waffling, so let's just jump right into it because I haven't actually explained what the Arbor Ruffini theorem is. So let's, let's have a look. Um, so here is my complex plane, which, well, you should think of there being a coordinate system, if you want, uh, with the origin being my green point. I don't want to illustrate the uh, origin because then it gets a little bit, uh, as a, the coordinate system, because then it gets a little bit uh, cumbersome and very clustered. Anyway, but you can think of I have a complex plane with the origin somewhere, and I'm interested in solving a very simple equation uh, depending on one, one parameter. B, in general, I would have more parameters depending on the degree of my equation, but it turns out that I only need one to explain uh, what goes wrong. And my parameter is always B. And I think of it as, as moving freely around in the plane. I will show you uh, an, an illustration or a Mathematica code also linked in the description uh, in a second. But basically I would like to uh, move this point around and I would like to see how the roots move around. Uh, the corresponding root of this polynomial. Of course, this is basically trivial because if this is b, then this should be minus b. So they are linked by just some easy symmetry by just swapping the sign. So if b loop moves around like this, then the other one would move around exactly in the same way. And very importantly, if b would make a loop 
then the root will make the kind of the opposite loop. But it would still loop and become itself. And of course, all of you know that the basic uh, operations of arithmetic, by which I mean addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, of course, suffice to uh, solve this polynomial equation, or maybe more general, a polynomial equation of, of this form with uh, two coefficients, a times x plus b. And you want to solve it in the sense that it is zero. And by suffice, I mean that you potentially iterate your, um, your operations, right? In, in this case, you don't need to, but in later you, you will, we will. And kind of the easiest, so this is a linear equation, right? This is part of linear algebra. Linear algebra is about solving multiple of those. And of course, this is ancient. I mean, <laughs> everyone here probably can solve this equation. Um, as I said, this is not, not really hard. So what you could hope for is you could actually push this further. Um, by what I mean is you would look at the equation of degree two, for example, something like that, which we'll see in a second. And, and maybe maybe you can actually solve that using the um, some combinations of um, these basic uh, operations of arithmetic. And now you might say, oh, wait, 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 I, I know this, the solution to the degree two uh, equation. I'm going to show you that solution in a second again, anyway. Um, the quadratic formula, and it involves a root, right? It involves a near square root. So no, 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 you, you can't. Uh, get away by just using those equations. That's not really a proof, right? It, it could be that there is some really, really crazy combination of those uh, operations, which kind of mimics the behavior of taking a square root. Absolutely possible. At this stage, I've, we basically don't know. Um, I think this was just so obvious that this, of course, doesn't work, that people never proved it, but it's part of the Abini Abel Ruffini theorem that just actually doesn't work. And let me explain how you can see that this doesn't work if you go to the uh, degree two equation. So you need at least another operation for the degree two equation. And another operation will be, of course, taking square roots. But before, let me summarize, in order to solve degree one polynomial equations, the basic operations of arithmetic are completely sufficient and yeah, you know that, right? You can construct the rational numbers, for example, from the integers just using uh, the basic uh, operations of arithmetic. So this is kind of known. And you might hope that you could push this further, right? Why not? Turns out that you can't. So same picture. So the roots are now the red two red points. This is the degree two equation. Uh, it's still my complex plane in the background. You can think of having here uh, a coordinate axis system and the B is the coefficient I will vary in a second. So using Mathematica. So let's, um, so what you should observe is the following. As, as, as I'm going to vary B, um, the roots will vary continuously. And that's kind of the main insight here. So if you vary B continuously, the roots will vary continuously. But the point is, uh, if B moves in a loop, then the roots do not move in, in a loop. And that, that, that's a problem, as we will see, in, as I will explain in a second. But first, let's have a look at Mathematica. So here's a Mathematica demonstration linked in the description. And it's exactly the picture you've seen before. The red dots are the loops. Um, the blue dots are certain critical values. I will explain them in a second. And the red, uh, the red, of course, the black dot in the middle is my coefficient b. And this all of this lives in the, in the complex plane. So the static position is b equals 0. And in case b equals zero, my equation is x squared uh, minus one equals zero, um, uh, plus one equals zero. And the two solutions are i and minus i, as you can see here. Okay, this is how you should read it. And as soon as I move my coefficient, the roots move basically continuously in a very nice way, as you can see here. Okay, and now comes a critical observation. I start here. And I move my coefficient in a loop. I move it around blue. And have you seen what happened? The two red things changed places while I moved in a loop. Let me do it again. I move in a loop. The two red roots changed places. I move in a loop. The two red roots changed places. I could move in a loop around here, of course, as well. 
the true wet roots change places. That's pretty exciting. And that's pretty nice. So let's do it again. Right? So um, red, uh, blue, uh, sorry, B moves in a loop, but um, the roots do not move in a loop. And that is now a problem. Why is that a problem? Well, um, let's say you would have a, a closed formula in the operations of arithmetic and in the coefficients. So whatever, something like um, if you would like to solve whatever, a x squared plus b x plus c equals zero. And it, the solutions would be whatever s1 being something in whatever, two a b minus c, something like that. And s2 would be, I don't know, um, whatever. Doesn't matter, a times c squared uh, divided by b, whatever, something like that, doesn't really matter. Um, the following would kick in. So uh, loops in my coefficients mean I, I, the coefficient stays the same. So if I loop everything here, those things are fixed. So those expressions will be fixed because the coefficient stays the same. But on the same time, those two swap places. In other words, you just can't write down a solution formula because one side of the formula uh, stays fixed and the other swaps places. And that's a very nice argument, actually, that you can't do with any function uh, in uh, so any expression in this uh, uh, operations of arithmetic. And actually, it shows a bit more. You ca also can't use functions that are defined on the whole complex plane, so continuous or let's say smooth on the whole complex plane. So you also can't use something like an x or a cosine or something like that. It also doesn't work. So there is no formula in x cosine or whatever that would solve a, a, a quadratic equation. And that's a very easy argument. So let me repeat it. So what I did is, or basically this is Arnold's idea, of course I haven't done that. Anyway, um, if you move uh, the coefficients, and I only need one to illustrate that, in a, in a circle, uh, in a loop. So return to where it was before, right? It hasn't changed. At the same time, the roots swap places. And this just can't work because you have exactly this phenomena that something swaps and, well, the other side of the equation stays the same. Very short and slick proof that you cannot solve a degree two polynomial equation using operations of arithmetic. And you even cannot solve it using uh, functions that are defined on C. And note hereby that the root function is not defined on C because you always have this ambiguity, which one is which, right? And that's, that's exactly what, what uh, happens here. You all have this ambiguity of which one is which. That's why um, you have this swap here. So basically there is no quadratic formula but built out of finite combinations of plus minus times and division. Very short and slick proof, very nice. And this proof generalizes and we're basically already there. So let's have a look at degree three. Um, again, I'm going to Mathematica in a second, but what will happen here is that we allow one more operation, of course. So we already know that we need some square root. So let's, uh, square root of two, for example, uh, let's uh, add square root of n's, right? Let's allow those as well. You're still not there. So if you want to look at the cubic equation, uh, linked in the description, if you want to uh, see. So here's a, um, the one you, you certainly know, the degree two one. Um, this is very famous and it, it's, it's an expression in those roots and the natural operations from arithmetic, right? And degree four and five uh, were discovered about 500 years ago. It's actually a fun story linked in the description. Um, but they are reason reasonably ugly. I shouldn't call them ugly, but I, I, I mean, I, I certainly can't remember them. But if you look at them, again, linked in the description, you would see that they need more than just roots. They need and even more than just inst roots. They need operations that look like a little bit like this. So nested roots. Okay, so you wouldn't need nested roots to solve them. And if you know that, you might make a guess that somehow you should see that on the loops. You should see on the loops that you need nested roots to solve it. Okay, but I will explain that in a second. So for now, um, let's uh, make our toolbox a bit bigger by not just allowing the basic operations of arithmetic, but also allowing 
the basic, well, including now a basic operation in algebra, and I call this the basic operations of algebra, the operations of algebra, namely allowing roots and um, also nested roots. So those guys here. And an arbitrary finite nesting of those things. Okay. Um, okay. And then people 500 years ago have discovered that you can solve degree four and five. And the question then would be how far can you push that? But first, let's have a look at this picture here. And um, I will uh, start Mathematica in a second. So there is an operation, an algebraic operation called the commutator. And in this case, I just want to think about the commutator of loops. And it's just the following operation. Um, so here's an illustrated in black. So a commutator of two loops. So I have one loop which goes around like this. And I have another loop which goes around like this. So always clockwise around my uh, loop points. This is loop A. Let's say this is loop B. Then the commutator of those two would be um, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, which just means you go A, then you go B, then you get, go A the other way around, indicated by this arrow here. And then you go B the other way around. So it's, it's really a for loop. So you go, in this case, you go, this way, then you go this way, then you go this way, and then you go, I hope, this way. So this four times around those uh, blue points. And this is a bit hard to see in the Mathematica, that's why I have it illustrated here, but we'll try to see that in a second. And while you do that, you see that those roots actually swap places in this nice fashion, which in um, notation, if you are like permutation groups, would be one goes to two, two goes to three, and three goes to one. Okay, so you permute those coefficients uh, while you're applying a commutator. Okay, so every commutator in loops is, in this case, um, just a cyclic permutation of, um, of the roots. And it turns out that this is not fixed by just taking one root. This is only fixed if you, um, uh, th this is again a problem because one root would, would fix this commutator. Uh, you need to, uh, a nested secret on sort of roots. So basically uh, what's going on here is um, if you just write it down, it's not so hard to see. If you have a commutator and you apply a commutator to, to loops, and this is again just uh, a fancy terminology for, for exactly this operation that I just showed you. So going around, going around, going around in the opposite way, going around in the opposite way. That shows that you need at least, um, at least uh, for, at, this, was, this was degree three, you, would, you need at least a, a, nest, a nesting of level two or whatever you want to call this. So some um, expression like this. And if you look at the quadratic, uh, the cubic formula and linked in the description, Yes, you really need those. And th th you can prove that by just using, uh, by looking at commutators of, of, of loops, which is a little bit more complicated to see than what I just showed you for degree two, but it's basically the same idea. Uh, let's run Mathematica and let's see whether I can see actually what I just claimed is true. So here's Mathematica, same setup. This is my B. This is X cubed plus B plus one. It has three roots and it has three critical points. So, um, Let's have a look what the roots do as I uh, move my, well, you can see they swap places, very good. So if I loop, they swap places. So I certainly can't solve the degree three equation just using operations of algebra. Uh, no, sorry, operations of arithmetic, but maybe I can, I can go away by just using, well, roots instead of nested roots. And what I would do in order to, to see that this is actually not true I would go a commutator. I would go this way. So the point is back where it started and those two have swapped places. I will go this way. The point is uh, again where it started and this, the, the left one has moved all the way from, from down here. So it has moved all the way here. Okay. This one came originally from here and this one came originally from here. So if this is one, this is two, position, position one, position two, position three, then three has moved to one. 
and um, so so one has uh, sorry one has moved to three, and three has moved to two, and two has moved to one. That's not quite what I showed you, because I'm also missing the second part of the commutator. So have a look. Okay, now those two swap places, and the last one, and those two swap places again. And if you would track this, for example, by doing running it yourself, you can run it yourself this Mathematica code. Um, so the demonstration, um, or, or another one actually also linked in the description, if you don't like to run Mathematica, and you will realize that that is exactly what I claimed. It's a permutation one, two, three. And then the argument is exactly the same as before. If you look at an equation um, involving only roots, so let's say uh, the outside one here, um, then you can say uh, can see a permutation of two elements, but you can't see the cycle. That's the whole problem. Uh, so you actually can't solve the degree three equation only using um, uh, operations of arithmetics and uh, radicals, so roots, uh, without nesting them. So we certainly should allow nesting um, of, of those expressions. And then you do degree four and you realize, okay, you, you're still good with nesting. The degree four equation is, is, is horrible. I think I've, so the degree four equation is good. The degree four equation is totally good. The degree four equation solution is horrible. I think I've never seen it written down. Um, it, it's usually stated in the general um, polynomial is reduced to the specific polynomial and that is unsolved. But anyway, you can have a look at the description uh, if, into the link in the description if you really want to see that formula. Um, I would recommend not to. Anyway, <laughs> some people, let's say 500 years ago, uh, were really, really happy that they found that formula. And it, it's pretty amazing that they did if you, if you see the formula. Anyway, um, I'm already starting waffling. Back to the topic. So, um, okay, so with degree three, you realize, okay, you need to nest roots because of this double loop or this commutator argument. With degree four, you realize you still need to nest loops. You need to nest one order more, actually. Um, uh, we, I, will, I will show that to you in a second why you need that. Um, but you're still good with a finite nesting of, of, um, of well, roots. And then you might guess, okay, maybe in each step you need one more nest, nesting level. So for level five, uh, for degree five, you might need one more nesting level. The formula will be horrible, um, but, but maybe you, you, it's just horrible and that's why it's so hard to find. Turns out that whatever, uh, 300 years of very smart mathematician were thrown at this problem and it still uh, was still standing, which made, I think, people believe that it's probably not correct. You probably can't do that. So uh, the question is, how far can we push this? We can push this to degree four, but not any step further, sadly. And that's exactly then the theorem, whose proof, were, so for degree uh, five or bigger those operations of algebra, which I say again is uh, plus for for me at least plus uh, times subtraction division uh, and roots and nesting of those operations. They do not suffice anymore, which I think is very surprising. So if you if you see the pattern, like uh, in degree two, or you think you have a pattern. In degree two, you need roots of nesting order one. In degree three, you need roots of nesting order two. In degree four, you need roots of nesting order. Um, here it is, one more. And this is expressed by that you, if you take a commutator of, your com of a commutator and it's not trivial, then you need one more nesting level. And here's just a computation that you can, can try to do. So um, using Mathematica, for example. Um, so um, if you would loop around one, two and two, three, and you, you, well, and use the co corresponding commutator and then two, three and three, four, then you would get something non-trivial and that solution is not detected again. Um, it cannot be detected again by a nesting order of too low level. Okay, so, and that's what you would need to show. You would need to show that a K ne nesting of commutators correspond to a K nesting of, um, of those roots uh, operators. For example, um, degree four or bigger needs at least two nesting stages. And I think I, I got now confused about the, what I call two nesting. Uh, this is a one nesting and the degree four needs one nesting more. So well, anyway, um, so it shows that you need at least those nestings. 
And then something funny happens, which you can call uh, the law of small numbers. So for degree, well, what degree one is trivial, degree two, you need one nesting and all commutators are trivial. That's why you need one nesting. In degree three, you need uh, one nesting more and uh, uh, one ex so one expression in the commutator is non-trivial. In degree four, you can write down a, a twice nested commutator and it's non-trivial. And you might say in degree five, I can write down at most is three times nested in degree six, I can write down at most the four times nested and so on. Turns out that from degree five onwards, so here's an expression that you can try, which needs five symbols. Uh, that's the whole point, uh, which are i, j, k, l, m, l, m, n. So you, you can have one, two, three, four, five, for example, if you want. Um, you can arbitrary nest commutators without ever being trivial because, uh, well, this permutation of length three, any permutation of length three can be written as a commutator of a permutation of length of those um, as three cycles, not a permutation of length three, right? So a three cycle JKM can be written as a commutator of three cycles. And then of course, then you can write the commutator of three cycles as a commutator of three cycles and the commutator of three cycles, you can write them as commutator of three cycles. So you can nest arbitrary nest those um, those expressions, and that by the very same argument, by looking at the orbits, so the, the looping argument shows that you can't, you really can't write down any equation in general anymore for degree five, um, which which would give a, some kind of nice analog of of this uh, degree two equation here, even not if you would allow whatever a nesting of order five thousand, you still couldn't do it. So for, for any nesting order, you can show that won't work by course, constructing the course, corresponding commutator, which gives a kind of a huge permutation of those, of, those, um, of, of those loops. So actually no degree, and of course, if you can do degree five, or you can't do degree five, you of course can't do, do degree six or whatever, um, because you need five symbols, right? If you have five symbols, if you have six symbols, you certainly have five symbols. So you can't do that. And that's the whole theorem. Uh, a very, very nice theorem based, well, a very, very nice theorem, which was very open, which was an open problem for a long time. And the argument was also very nice. It's really just a slightly more complicated version of, well, we can't solve um, the degree two equation using those operations, because if I loop the coefficients, I will swap the roots. And yeah, I would contribute this proof, proof to Arnold or maybe to the uh, paper linked in the description, but it actually was originated basically if you, what, what I'd like to say without offending anyone. Um, basically, if you read Abel's proof carefully, you would come up with this argument. Maybe, maybe, maybe that was uh, neutral enough. Um, anyway, so this was known to Abel and kind of was a starting point of Galois theory. So back to Galois theory, as I said, you don't need to know Galois theory, but of course this Galois theory was playing in the background. And what Galois theory does for you is, well, it, it, tell, it gives you a machine to decide what polynomial equations you can solve or not. Okay, let me go to my last slide, namely what the arbel raffinet theorem not implies, what it does not imply. Um, first of all, it does not imply that you can't solve any, right? It just said you can't solve any degree five equation because for example, this one is very easy to solve uh, using exactly the operations that I've told you about. Um, it just says in general, you can't write down a formula, right? You can't write down a formula in the coefficients. That, that's the only statement. You of course can solve certain uh, degree five equations. Maybe this is even too complicated. You can solve something like X five equals zero if you want to think about it a little bit. Uh, this is not really hard to solve, right? So you can solve certain equations. And as I said, the whole point of Galois theory is to tell you basically uh, from what uh, equation you can expect to have uh, a way to solve them, an algebraic way to solve them. You always have an analytic way to solve them. And by an analytic way, I would mean something like, um, you can have, right, I, the abel ruffini theorem shows that there is no expression using a, a finite, um, uh, iteration of or finite nestedness of those um, 
of those uh, roots, root symbols. But you can have infinite well, nestings. And yeah, for example, if you really want to solve uh, Abel's original equation, which was x5 minus x minus one, um, you can actually use this expression. So this expression con converges to the real solution uh, of this polynomial equation. So the fifth root of one plus the fifth root of one plus the fifth root of one plus the fifth root of, but this is really, it converges, right? This is not really an expression of algebra anymore. And of course this works in general and for uh, your favorite, uh, well, <laughs> if it's not as easy as this one, it might take you a while to write down the expression in terms of um, iterated, infinitely iterated and nested sequences of uh, operations of algebra, but you should be able to do it in the end. Well, in principle, at least, probably not. In, so I certainly couldn't do it in practice, but in principle, it, it is possible. And that's not an algebraic solution anymore, but that's of course also not ruled out by uh, the Abel-Ruffini theorem. Okay, so let me summarize. The Abel-Ruffini theorem is this fantastic statement that there is no quadratic formula for degree five. That's basically what it is. And that's nice to know, in particular, if you know the history and people tried for a long, long time to find those formulas, it's actually a very nice statement. But the main point, at least for me, is the proof because it was a door opener for Galois theory. It was kind of the beginning of Galois theory. And the proof is just observing that certain operations on the roots, certain in technical terms, group actions on the roots, um, can, can be reflected in how to solve, how, how the solution formulas for, or is reflected how solution formulas um, look like for those polynomial equations. And then you can just kind of use plain algebra to rule out that there are certain types of uh, solutions. For example, for this degree two solutions, uh, a, a really simple argument rules out that there is no expression in terms of the basic uh, operations of arithmetic, even including things like exponentials or cosines or sines or something like that, which is not completely obvious. A beefed up argument, uh, a beefed up version of that argument actually then shows the Abel-Ruffini theorem itself. And that's why I like so. But that's why I like it so much, mostly because of its proof and because of the implications um, you can derive from uh, the proof. Uh, yeah, anyway, I'm already starting waffling, so I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.